uh, right now. So if you're switching rooms or anywhere, um, but we'll get started here in just a few moments. So you all here um, or continue to be here for the We Build on the Success of Fedora Next track. Um, up next here, we are going to do a roundtable discussion of packaging issues for modern language ecosystems. And I'm happy today uh, to present uh, Jens Peterson, who is an engineering manager at Red Hat. So I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, so actually, uh, the idea was that this should be kind of a, more like a roundtable kind of discussion. Um, I guess we'll have to see how that works out. So yeah, so this is an interesting talk in the sense that, uh, um, yeah, in the sense that it depends a lot on you what, uh, what comes out of the talk. So I, I don't have all the questions or all the answers or anything. I just, but I prepared a few slides to kind of set some context, um, which I hope helps. Um, yeah, so, yeah, also the title is probably a little bit off. I mean, it's not, uh, the, the scope isn't just packaging issues or sort of, it's more about how SIGs operate and workflows and processes and, well, packaging issues. Um, right, so, oh, can use this. yeah, so I, I just wrote down these sort of, these, these are very rough numbers. They're not, you should take them all with a grain of salt. They're, they're just, I just downloaded these with this uh, Pagua tool. Um, so it's just roughly the sort of si rough sizes of some of the different language ecosystems packaged in Fedora. Um, and they're, they're probably a bit off. I, I suspect they're probably more Python than Perl, but anyway, just by this, I think some of the Python packages are a bit inconsistently named. But anyway, you can see that yeah, at the top are like Perl and Python, and then there's Rust and Rulang, and then it's sort of, yeah, there's some PHP, and Haskell, Ruby, and um, so this, this is fine. I mean, I guess the thing is, a lot, a lot of these numbers look very big in the sense some of these ecosystems are absolutely huge. So in a sense, we're only capturing a very small fraction of, well, obviously we can't package every single little package in Fedora, but um, yeah, there's sort of a pretty, um, big gap there in some sense, um, but maybe this is good enough. At least it's a it's a good starting point, um, and I think we'll come back to this <laughs> this issue a little bit later because yeah, there's some. Um, I don't know how to do this. Um, okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, but also, you <laughs> notice that there's some pretty glaring omissions in that list. For example, the JavaScript is not there. I think we. We know that yeah, so a lot of the node packages disappeared a few years back from Fedora, for better or worse. Um, also, Java is another very big system which is almost completely absent. I mean, obviously we have Java and Fedora, but uh, not really um, packages much. Um, but yeah, I'm a bit curious about who's here. So, who uh, is anyone? Particularly involved in any language SIGs, or to a lesser or greater degree, or, or not, not really. <laughs> okay. I am fairly involved into the GoLang one, Go the on. local okay. GoLang issue. Okay, great. Cool. Anyone else? Um, so I am involved in the Rust SIG, but I used to be more in the past. I kind of not the last month, but a bit. Cool. Great, thanks. Anyone else? No, no. Oh. So I'm not involved in any of the SIGs, uh, at least language SIGs, but uh, I do maintain a number of packages written in different languages, and okay. in particular, uh, in JavaScript, yeah, because I maintain a couple of uh, Firefox extensions, and I, well, I don't have the time, but I'd love to have a, you know, best practices document for packaging JavaScript like we do for Python and um, GoLang and so on. So, somebody help me. <laughs> it's, I guess I, I wanted to say. Come on. Oh. Uh, I'll just echo that. Um, 
I'm not involved in any of the language SIGs, but we have an infra SIG for infrastructure packages, and I maintain, I don't know, 250 packages or something like that. So any of the kind of solutions or broad tools for languages could very well apply to that sort of thing, and that's what I'm hoping right. for. Right. Um, you know, just better ways to maintain stuff or, or handle it. Absolutely, yeah. Since everyone is presenting, <laughs> uh, I'm here since I recently tried to package my first Googling uh, package and realized the complexities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and uh, it got sidetracked, so it, uh, it's a night, uh, but I'll get, get back to it. Cool. Yeah, uh, and I, I'm, I'm pretty involved in the Haskell. Um, Yes, well, it's a very small city. It's mostly me and one or two people. But um, all right, um, let's keep moving because I want to sort of get more into the discussions. Um, so yeah, I, I just noted down a few of the current changes for Fedora 39. Um, I think there's probably more things happening, but these are the changes I could see, um, like Perl and Python. I think we all saw the big uh, sort of Perl rebuild for 3.12, which was. I guess it went reasonably well from my <laughs> distant perspective. And uh, yeah, there's this change to remove all the Golang leaves, which I'm, I don't know. Does, it, does anyone know anything about that? Or, uh, maybe not. And yeah, I have a change for um, Haskell, which is um, getting ready. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, I, I just put this slide in because I, don't know, I thought it's kind of interesting just to think about the priorities of SIGs and how they fit in with the Fedora values. Like, um, I mean, one, one thing I really need in, my, in the Fedora, in the Haskell SIG is more people, so my like friends and, you know, I've struggled with this over time getting, we have a real lack of manpower, so like, yeah, it's really hard to get package reviews done even because, yeah. Anyway, maybe some of the new ideas like the, uh, Review swaps, like on uh, discourse or so, may help. Um, and then there's the first, like uh, yeah, and I think like my Fedora maybe was one of the first distros to adopt Python 3.12, for example. Um, um, yeah, and freedom, maybe ties in with licensing, and um, yeah, so. Um, all right. Does anyone have any comments on this? Oh, oh yeah. Maybe a story. I was uh, working on compatibility with Python 3.12, and like for three different patches, I had replies from upstream. But where did you get Python 3.12 and NumPy working with it? It doesn't work with NumPy 3.12 yet. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I, this is a little uh, interlude. I wanted to sort of probe people what kind of problems they're seeing or what, what kind of pain points, um, things to think about. And so from the Go perspective, I see a very big uh, process issue or tooling issue, uh, whatever you want to put it, because the problem is that we have roughly 2,000 packages for 200 application that we really care about. And then 1.8 thousand packages just because of how RPM works and how we decided to package RPM packages within Fedora, which would mean that if we can change that process uh, or, those, or change the tooling to allow a different process, we can immediately have one-tenth of the packages and therefore way more manpower per package. So in our case, I think it's more a process uh, or tooling issue more than a main power issue. Mm -hmm. So um, one way to approach this would be to automatize the, the management of packages, right? I keep the packages as a step uh, and build on top of this. Does this sound feasible? So we do have go to RPM, which 
uh, really helps in creating RPM packages. Uh, there are a couple of issues though. The first one is that even with go to RPM, we don't have a perfect spec file. So it, it's a very good starting point. Don't get me wrong on this, but um, it's not perfect. So it's not something you can completely automate. You can, you should still doing the reviews. You well, you should first reread your spec file, fix eventual issues, do uh, apply for the review, do the review, and everything else. And the other big problem is that. Uh, due to the Go and Rust have this fact that basically they create a static binary. So we only use 90% of the packages just for the sources, not for any intermediate things, which means that if we change one source package, one of those library packages, we don't have any real effect on the binaries that have already been built. So we should re-kick builds and builds and builds which we don't do, uh, let, let's be frank, which means that a lot of times we do have bugs that should be fixed but are not fixed in our binaries because we have not done the rebuild. The big problem is that we have some packages that are depend that uh, we have 2,000 packages depending on those, and if we have a new version of the library, of the core library, and we kick 2,000 packages every few days, I don't think Koji would be happy with that. Um, but aside from that, there is also a discoverability issue and that kind of things, as well as uh, conflicting library versions. So a lot of times we end up having multiple source packages for the same library for different versions just because we have applications that we care about, are the only things that we really care about that are depending on different versions. Obviously, we can work around this, and we have done this for the last, I don't know, five, six years. But it, I don't think is a very good way of handling this kind of thing. And I think that if we are able to change processes or, and or tools, then we can be way more efficient at doing this. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe I could, I want, this is probably a bit special, but in, in Haskell, we have a kind of a good situation where we actually have a kind of upstream distrib source distribution called, it's called stackage. Um, so, you know, so what I'm doing in Fedora is basically just pulling down packages from stackage. And so there's a unique, so we only ship one version of a library basically. Um, and, and all those packages are kind of supposed to be compatible with each other. Um, well, there are some exceptions. There are some packages in Fedora which are not in stackage, but largely that works fairly well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I also don't know of any other language ecosystems which have such a distribution. Maybe there are some, but um, yeah. Um, which one? LaTeX. I mean, it's not a ah, language, okay, but right, right. they, they yeah, do yeah, have yeah, a big right. distribution that we can life. repackage the right, whole right. thing. So, True. yeah. But I, I think that it, it, the interesting part is that some of those uh, languages have some kind of issues, others have very different kind of issues. So, for instance, Python um, have issues because obviously there are a billion pack Python packages. Um, but the good part for them is that since everything is on um, runtime compiled, or at least uh, interpreted, um, right. as long as, I mean, I think the current model kind of works for Python. Maybe better tooling can help with a bunch of things. Obviously, they do have uh, problems with supporting multiple versions of Python and other kind of things like this. But um, others like Go and Rust have very specific issues due to their static nature rather than the others that have other kind of issues. Mm. Right, you mentioned the need to rebuild, like to, that you need to rebuild your binaries to get like uh, updated library fixes in, um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the issue is that uh, in Go, for instance, let's say you have a binary that depends on 10 libraries, um, it will be statically compiled so that basically you have one binary that, com and that at runtime depends on zero library, if not libc and 
a couple of very basic uh, libraries. So that means that those libraries, even though maybe in RPM packages are splitted in different packages, because we package every library in a different RPM package, in the reality, in the binary RPM packages, we only have one binary file in the leaf package. Mm -hmm. All the other packages are there just to make Koji or the builder happy. Is they are not there for the user. Mm. Right, but, but uh, yeah, but, I mean, like you can sort of go to the extreme, like the Rust has done in Fedora, where they only ship source, in a sense, source. All the libraries are only available as sources, and then you can build something using those sources. Um, um, I mean, it's some, it, yeah. I mean, maybe it's it's pragmatic. I guess I don't know. I I can't say I like it, but um, I mean, my my dream is that users should actually be using these packages. But maybe it's unrealistic dream. I don't know these days. Um, yeah. Um. So a quick comment on that: that for users, those packages are completely useless. They are they only useful for yes. building other packages. Mm. So I mean, I. It's a complex problem, but uh, I, I wanted to make a comment earlier about the, um, the stuff that you mentioned that um, the initially generated spec file needs adjustments. And um, for us, I think we're very close to, to having like 99% of packages generated either ideally or generated um, in a way where the changes made by the packager after the fact can be propagated. And um, I mean, either through, through, through an explicit patch or through metadata that gets applied when the generation happens. So it's like the, you apply some switches when generating the spec file, and those switches are saved to a config file. And then this is in this, this git. And when you regenerate the spec file from scratch, you don't do anything. You, you, and I think that this is a good model, because this allows automation to happen. Uh, and I can kind of imagine a, a situation where if this is automated and this can f happen fully automatically, we could, for example, have, um, I don't know, pull requests in, in this kit in Azure that do the whole thing. And uh, then it's a small step to automate or to allow anybody to do rebuilds in some fashion that doesn't require proven packager privileges. Because I think that Part of the problem is that we have, a, mm, I mean, doing stuff in Fedora if you're not a proven packager, uh, in those ecosystems is just impossible. In, in other ecosystems, it's okay, but there you just need to write to a hundred packages at any given time, and yeah, and we we could solve this. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if this is the solution, but we could adjust our permission models to to allow this. So the way we solved the, the permission problem was with uh, creating the Golang SIG, assigning, but uh, we have also amended, well, proposed, and then it got accepted, a rule uh, so that every Golang package has to have the Golang SIG as a committer. So we are working around this. But the, my frustration with this is that, as you were saying, uh, all those source packages have zero value for the users. Uh, between Rust and Go, we are shipping, I don't know, three, 4,000 packages that have zero value for the user. We are just cluttering repos, uh, the meta, uh, metadata of the repos, everything else, just because we want to apply a process that does not fit for these kind of things. Or, or like the, the permission, the, the Golang SIG permission on everything, which basically is a proven packager. Because if you have access to, I don't know, 10% of the whole repository, it's basically a proven packager uh, level, which, by the way, is granted just adding a comment, b being a packager, and adding a comment into a, 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 a ticket. You get straight away uh, access to a couple thousand packages, which probably is not ideal either. But all those are workaround 
because the system does not apply for those packages. So that's why I'm saying that I think that we should try to think also a different process that would apply for those languages because at the moment it's Go and Rust, but I foresee in the future many other languages having very similar issues because I think that if we decide ways or if we have tools to introspect packages um, so that we can introspect packages after the fact um, in a way that it's we, we don't have to have all those pa uh, those source packages but only the leaf ones then everything becomes easier and another issue that I see is that let's say a new contributor wants to package you know uh, whatever uh, interesting tool they are using um, they might discover that they need to package 50 packages and have 50 reviews which then becomes a huge burden on the reviewers uh, obviously it's way easier to review golang things than uh, maybe uh, other kind of packages but still it's a lot of work just because we want to apply a process that does not apply so i think that we should really think through the process and see if we can just do binaries with vendor stuff basically because uh, that would be I think the the optimal situation and then have tools to then be able to discover those vendor uh, libraries and then do for instance free builds and that kind of things based on those metadata mm -hmm. So um, I think that in the case of the dependencies that you mentioned, there's uh, two parts to the, to the review of the dependencies, right? One is like the, the mechanistic packaging of dependencies so that they get um, dropped into the build route so that you can then use them. And um, I think it's like the, this most visible part but there is also the, the review of, of, of licensing and um, I don't know, just a general review of, of the, the stuff that happens. And so the second part is actually useful and I think that we want to keep it. The first part is just a technical detail that we could get rid of. So, so I think that the question needs to be how can we keep um, the, the, the quality control over, over the dependencies that we have right now without um, this extra process that is complicating life, life for people. And uh, I mean, I think that we shouldn't concentrate on the, like on the, you know, package part because with automation, this could be um, simplified quite a bit. Like I can imagine a script where you're like, uh, you're in the Golang SIG and you, you press uh, some, some uh, do some invocation and it adjusts 50 different packages in a way that you can review and push at once and th th we could ha make this happen. Um, I think it would be important to figure out how, to, how do we deal with the, uh, the licensing issues and the, the uh, uh, introspection of the dependencies if we change the process. Thanks. Uh, so uh, at least in Go, uh, defining um, understanding the license, it's deterministic, in the sense that, for instance, the Golang documentation gives you the license of every package you look the documentation for. So effectively, there are ways to extract this kind of information, and that's I, I totally agree with your point. There there is value in the process, but I think that we can also get the value outside the process. Uh, so, for instance, let's say that we add one step into the CI/CD pipeline of Golang packages, adding one step that checks all the dependencies of all the, uh, the, the libraries that gets vendored in, and if those are within a certain list of acceptable uh, licenses, then it gets shipped, otherwise it gets blocked. I'm thinking something like this, uh, and it can be, I guess, that in Rust you do have ways to discover a license, um, because I guess that your Rust to RPM or whatever it's called also does the same thing as well. So um, 
effectively, you could have a different step from the Golang one, because obviously you would have a different way to, to discover the license, but still uh, be able to use the same idea behind it, um, but with different steps for different languages. Yeah, but I, I think I, I kind of agree with Benny that um, having pure, purely automating the licensing is a little, license checking is a bit tricky. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's yeah. I mean, I agree with you. From from many purposes, maybe it would work. But there are, but there are often cases where there are mistakes in packages, like the wrong license tag has been put in a package or things like that. So yeah, it's a little bit on thin ice. I think if it's completely automated. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it might be one something that could be explored. But, oh, sorry. I think I lost it. Again. <laughs> Well, could you disable the screen lock? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, also, I just wanted to add a I mean, I, I, bet, I mean, I agree that in some sense, all these libraries, packages are kind of useless, but I mean, in a sense, not, not users don't care about it. But I, that still makes me sad in a way, because I feel like as a distro, we should be providing binaries. So, because there's actually a lot of wasted, uh, I mean, in terms of, um, yeah, like in terms of, I mean, <laughs> global warming and so on. There's so much wastage of rebuilding and rebuilding and, and re rebuilding binaries. Um, so, uh, for me, I mean, there's things like Nix and so on and Kashix, where I mean there are caches of binaries and so on. So, uh, I don't know. I feel ideally we should actually be making those. Binary is useful, so that users would use them. I mean, that, that would be the ideal. Maybe it's ambitious or we're unrealistic, I don't know. But that would be my desire. <laughs> we actually had uh, meaningful binaries um, that users could use. Um, yeah. Like, like, like if I build something in Haskell using the libraries which are packaged in Haskell, it, it, I can build something really fast, whereas if I build it with um, like the upstream tools or whatever, then it, it takes much longer to build them. Um, so yeah, you look you look puzzled. <laughs> yes, because it does not apply for going across. Why? Why doesn't it apply? It does not apply to Go, at least, and I believe also Rust uh, is the same way. Because due to how the Go compiler works, it will always try to compile from sources. You cannot pre-ship, pre-build artifacts that it will be used. It will always start from all the sources of all uh, of your application and all dependencies and dependencies of dependencies and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And because the, doing a big bang uh, compilation, it will do optimization throughout code paths and that kind of things and exclude all the part of the libraries that will not be hated by your application and so on. So effectively, due to how the compiler works, what you are describing does not apply to Go. Now, we can argue on the dy dynamic of Go and the compiler itself, but that is how the language works. So other we uh, fork the Go compiler, which I don't think we want to do, or we accept that Go does not work that way. Mm. All right, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so experienced with Go or Rust, but so even Rust doesn't cache builds locally for like. No, no, it's 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 this exactly this, like this. You ha you have sources and you you build from scratch, doing optimization okay. uh, of the whole thing at once. Hmm. Essentially, link time, or compile time, and link time optimization. Okay. Because like in Haskell, the, there's two tools, uh, Cabal and Stack, and both of them cache, uh, basically cache, build, cache. So if you build some library and then you build it again, it will, it'll, it will use the same uh, um, binaries like to link two separate uh, packages. I mean, it can do, so. Anyway, um, let me see if I can move on. Uh, um, yeah, well, 
this is kind of what we have already discussing in some sense, but um, I mean, there's both there's, there's various issues about um, okay this was actually a different slide, but yeah I mean I, my, most users would tend to like often like use upstream and upstream like they might use the upstream binaries even for rust or and cargo and so on um, so I don't know I, I kind of see this as well. I don't know. I mean, that's. I don't know. From a distro point of view, it seems a bit problematic. Um, I mean, it's sort of the next <laughs> logical step. If you want, I mean, if you resign to not providing binaries, then why even why even bother using the distro compiler then? I mean, so I don't know. I, I still feel it's um, sort of. <laughs> Slippery slope, in some sense, um, yeah. But of course, we we want to have some things packaged in Fedora, so maybe we have to do the minimal work or, or stream, well, streamline. I, I agree with you completely that streamlining the processes and maybe if we could like even get it down to just like a license check or something like that, more or less, or that would be great, yeah. Because at the moment, this is still quite a big hurdle to get new packages in. Um, yeah. Um, any thoughts on this? Topic? So, um, I mean, if users really prefer the upstream binaries, then this is probably because they work better for the users. And um, I think that if we are providing binaries, which are, you know, like we think that they are good, but actually they don't have the, I don't know, like for example, they don't have certain features enabled because we haven't packaged some dependency, then it's it's not a, I mean, it doesn't benefit anybody. It's the, the users are getting the, the worst uh, experience if they use the package. Um, I mean, for me, I, I when I can use a package, it's great because first of all, I have a, a reliable delivery method. Uh, Second, I have a reliable cleanup method and I get updates. And um, I mean, like, yes, it, it, it makes sense to, to do packages when the packages are at least as good as the, mm, the upstream stuff. Mm. So in particular for Rust, um, if we do the whole process correctly, uh, the, the, the package, uh, the code delivered by the distribution is going to be exactly the same as the upstream one, right? Because it's the same compiler, the same sources. Um, mm. it's, it's a bit different in like traditional um, uh, systems where, uh, you know, like in C, where you have compilation flags and link flags and maybe some patches and a different version of the compiler. And this all means that if by the end, when you get to a um, end user, a uh, program that links to 200 packages, the way that you build each of those packages matters and then the result can be quite, quite different. Uh, here, for, for I think that in particular for us, you just end up with something that's maybe not binary identical, but functionally should be exactly the same. Um, I'm, not sure I'm not sure I was clear. <laughs> I think I haven't read it very clear. What, what I meant is that people are using the upstream toolchain, not 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 the not end not the end packages. I mean, that, in a sense. So yeah, but but for, so so you're using the upstream toolchain, and like so, let's say that you are a user and you get you get a new Fedora, and then you like okay, now I want to use this program. I have to install Cargo and do Cargo compile this, and then a week later I have to remember to update it. Then this is. A terrible user experience, right? The good user experience is that every few days you click update and then everything updates and you want to have sure. the same thing. Sure, and for me, this is the value provided by the distribution. Sure. Um, and uh, I think that that's what we should try to deliver, right? Like, like stuff compiled in the, the, well, in the way that upstream would compile it or, or maybe slightly better, just nicely delivered as packages so that you get automatism. We, we should not miss a distinction here between your Go and Rust and, uh, for example, other systems where we have the, where, where you include things. Uh, 
like Python, where people do a root pip install of something and break DNF is a, a prime example of where it goes wrong because you actually use the dependencies on the system and can break one program because you want to install another program, which is not the case when you do it statically linking. So the, it, it, it's a bit, it gives bit different aspects of this particular problem. That's my point. But I think it's actually a good example because we, we had this issue that People, users were doing pip install and breaking their systems, and we actually fix it at the root, right? Because now pip install does not break the, the system, and uh, we change the way that we do things so that it's nicer for the users to use the upstream uh, packaging if they want to. And I think that we need to do the same in other cases. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And if we pick uh, Go, for instance, the Fedora 39 change where we dropped a bunch of leaf packages, those were packages, uh, the mass retard Golang leaves. Basically, those are, were all the packages that were source packages and were not strictly required to compile our binaries. Basically, we are saying we don't care about the users because the users will not care about all those packages. The, the, way we, the reason why we have 2,000 packages, Golang packages, within Fedora is just to have 200 binaries. That's the only thing we care. We care about Kubernetes, we care about ATCD, GoPass, all the others. We do not care about Golang-Google-X-Sys uh, because the reality is that the Go and Rust is the same. It's like those new languages uh, are taught in a very different ways than C and the others were taught, where basically it was like, oh, we now have a compiler, we now have a standard library, we now have stuff. Let's give to the user the, the ownership of putting everything together. And in that world, distributions were great because they solved the issue for the user. We were able, as a distribution, to help the user. In those new tools where basically the compiler also downloads all the dependencies automatically and compiles them for you, it's like the distribution has no space there. Right. So we either work with them and change the way they work or we adopt to and accept the fact that users will not care about those packages. What you said, of course, is true. Uh, but I would not agree that uh, we shouldn't care uh, about the, all the library packages that are our dependencies, or well, that are dependencies for the few hundred packages that we actually care for, about, uh, because that's what people use. Uh, I still think there is uh, there are some there's some added value that the distribution can give. Uh, for example, uh, you know, when, well, with automation, this, this, this becomes tricky. There should be some gating still. Yeah, that's, that's one of the, of the things. So we've got gating, so any updates that break other stuff should get caught. You know how the compiler works. Okay, but, uh, you know, uh, when there is an upstream update, and uh, I, actually, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the uh, Golang or Rust ecosystems, but uh, I know there is, you, you can pin dependencies onto a particular version, but is, does it always happen, or can you just say, uh, I depend on version 1.5 up to, whatever, but not uh, newer than 2.0, for example, right? Yeah, you, you, you can specify them exactly, but also with the range, right? Usually, in Go, you specify exactly, and then when we package it, basically the way we do is we remove that hard limit. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, uh, in Go, um, you have the specific version pinned, like 1.7.4-1, um, and then we do a little bit of uh, trickery to make it work with slightly different versions. 
uh, otherwise everything would break. Um, but due to the way it, it would work upstream outside uh, Fedora, it would be with very specific versions pinned. Yeah, so, so what we, we're doing in Fedora is actually a bit different than what upstream is doing. Um, but actually upstream benefits from what we are doing because I think they do because they, they, they know that if we encounter problems, they, they know that uh, things will break when they do an update, right? So they, they need to react. Uh, I know you want to, you want to reply, but uh, another benefit is that, uh, um, yeah, uh, okay, I'll let you answer. Thank you. Uh, so yes and no. First, because uh, due to how the, the compilation works, upstream, let's say Hugo, for instance. Uh, Hugo is written in Go, they deliver a binary. They will only, upstream will only support issues on their binary. And if you are, go there and say, oh, I have this specific issue, and they are like, well, it does not apply to the binary with the right version of that library. So if you are on a wrong library, that's your problem. And they do have all their CI, CD for exactly those very tight versions. And we are trying to loosen a system where it's very tight upstream and everything works. We lose it, we break stuff, and it's our problem now. And the second issue is that often we are not um, working, we don't have libraries that are version higher than upstream. Upstream, at least in Go, uh, a lot of upstreams, simply one time every week, they update every single library they have. So they are way more bleeding edge than we are. So we are just lagging behind. We are doing a huge amount of work for, I would argue, very limited benefits. If it was zero cost, okay, yeah, whatever, who cares? But since it has a, an impact, it has a cost, it has a ton, tons of hours of contributors that are, gets them demotivated uh, from this, do we really want to have this? Okay, so you're obviously working with different upstreams than I am, because, well, I maintain a very limited set of Golang packages, but uh, when I get notifications from our release monitoring, Dot org, uh, uh, and I check w what the changes were. I don't always see, you know, the the dependencies updated. They they're usually pinned to whatever version th they were uh, at when they were added for a very long time. So I think th that's probably the disconnect between what you're seeing and what I'm seeing and. You know, what what I think uh, Fedora value is here. So. Yeah, maybe I'll continue a bit, and we can see. There's only ten minutes left. Um, there's a few other topics I wanted to cover. Um, I don't know. In in the context of our current discussion, I'm not sure how well it fits in. But one one is about package workflow. Um, we talked a bit about the uh, the high um, barrier to entry of packages. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what, what would it take to allow, to sort of really streamline this process of introducing new dependencies? I don't know what, because that would require some significant changes to uh, package review process. Or, I mean, may, maybe it should be done in a sort of six specific way because I don't know. I, I don't think we. I don't know. I, I'm not sure we can <laughs> open up the floodgates to any package just being kind of just coming into Fedora just on basis of license. So maybe Six would have to be involved in some kind of process around uh, that. I think that surely we can delegate stuff to Six. That could be an idea. Uh, though there are many Six that will have the same issues. So. Uh, personally, uh, the, the way I think it would be best, it would be that if the Fedora project says, look, we have analyzed multiple options, and we have seen that there are 
three possible, let's say three or one, uh, I mean two, three, four, five, whatever number of possible models uh, that can apply, you seek can choose which one of those flows better fits mm -hmm. your model. Mm -hmm. So that we don't have 20 different SIGs that everyone does different things or slightly different things, but still we do have a little bit more freedom uh, on a SIG perspective. And uh, uh, another thing that I think we should really fix is that a SIG should be able to be the owner of a package, uh, not individual contributor, not only individual contributors. Mm, so, uh, I think that um, essentially we are using the this Git metadata as a, a list of allowed dependencies for for for, for packages that are comp compiled uh, from source, including all dependencies, right? So, so uh, for us in Golang, and um, I think that we could switch to to a model where the same information is kept in a different way. Uh, I, I think it would require like a discussion of, of how to do it, but essentially I can imagine some model where we have a, a list of, uh, we don't actually package the dependencies, we just say, okay, well you have the dependency full and we just allow, I don't know, either all versions of full or versions of full between this and that and um, at compilation time, the package that specifies that it wants full with a specific version on a specific range gets some some uh, version of the dependency delivered, and the compilation happens in exactly the same way it happens right now. Because, right, you, you get some version of the dependency delivered, and you compile that. So, um, if we do this via some different mechanism than through the through this Git, then I think that. Uh, many things will become simpler. In, in particular, like pruning obsolete packages could mean that we don't prune stuff, they just stop being used and they don't bother anybody because mm -hmm. there is, um, that's one thing. And um, this also solves the problem of different packages requiring slightly different versions or even not slightly, but majorly different versions of the dependencies. It's, um, I mean, it would really simplify the life of uh, those ecosystems if you could just use what the upstream says by default, maybe allow overriding this. Um. Mm, very good ideas. Yeah, I like, I like the way you're going with this. Um, yeah, I mean, if we really can have something of this in the future, that would be pretty exciting. And that would open a lot of possibilities, I think. Um, um, all right, uh, yeah, I think we're running a bit short on time, but another topic I sort of wanted to touch, well, I don't know, I'm not sure if this is a good topic, but about RPM macros and, um, I don't know, it, it's pretty hard to change RPM now because it's so ubiquitous in, in our uh, operating system, but I don't know, I also feel that like the RPM macro language is pretty awful in many ways, but I guess it's sort of a, Worse is better kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of wish for some more modern declarative language, which, yeah, but I guess I'm dreaming. But um, maybe it's not really a, well, I don't know. I don't really, really need this to, to move forward. I think the, what we're just talking about now is probably the biggest um, problem that, yeah, that needs to be solved. But, um, uh, yeah, and then there's, I don't know, the things about like tooling and automation. And yeah, I, I was sort of hoping we could uh, have some knowledge sharing of uh, different tooling and automation around packaging, but we're also running short of time. So I don't know if anyone has anything they want to. Um, yeah, I know some, I think Golang is using dynamic build requires, um, which is interesting, um, yeah. Um. Yes, we are using uh, both spec generator dynamic build requires, but I really feel like we are trying to patch something just to make it work. 
dynamic mm. builder requires, like, I'm not saying that invalidate everything because they don't, but it's such a workaround around a process that is very static. It's like the RPM process is very static by nature. Mm. And to make it kind of workable, then we put dynamic stuff into it so that it becomes kind of acceptable. And it's like, yes, it's true, but we have changed the nature of that process itself. So at this point, I think that we should really think about like, uh, what was proposed as different disk it builds or that kind of thing so that basically it just flows the the, the part that we really care about. Mm. Well, yeah, it does feel like a bit of a hack, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I guess it works, but. Um, yeah, no, I just mentioned a few of my personal plugs here, but um, yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing I noticed um, is like misalignment or between like the upstream and the distro. Well, I guess we've sort of talked about it a bit, but for example, I think the Haskell is surprisingly well matched, or maybe because some of the packaging sort of distro packaging people were involved in the packaging system design originally. Um, so it kind of maps pretty well, whereas, I don't know, maybe some other languages it seems more tricky. Um, I don't know, maybe Python is almost the worst in some ways. I don't know, I'm not sure, but um, yeah. Um, anyway, we should probably start wrapping up. Um, yeah, I had a few other notes I made here, but um, yeah. I think someone brought up this idea about cascading rebuilds, like automatic rebuilding. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I think that's what Nix sort of does more or less. Um, but um, another thing is that I'm seeing a lot of new languages which almost can't be packaged because they use such weird packaging. It's a real problem, I feel like. It seems like a lot of new, new projects don't really have this idea of Having been packaged into a distro is like an afterthought or something, um, which makes it a bit, a bit sad too. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, one other thing that's interesting, I think, is this cross distro collaboration. I mean, we, we actually had, in Haskell, we had some collaboration with the OpenSUSE, which has been useful actually. Um, we used to share a bit more tooling, now they've slightly diverged. Um, they're actually more bleeding edge they, yeah, than Fedora, but in Haskell, but better. Um, yeah, so I think that's more or less what I was going to cover. But if anyone has any last ideas or thoughts or um, other things that we should think about in the future, I don't know. Um, So I think that, uh, I mean, we didn't discuss this at all, but I, I think that we need to reinvigorate the uh, packaging guidelines and packager documentation mm -hmm. uh, on the wiki and in the docs, because uh, I mean, there are some parts that are being updated regularly, but many parts are just full of obsolete stuff. I, you, you had F branch on one of the previous slides, and okay. like, if you're, if you're a new packager, I mean, how would you find out about those right. tools, right? Yeah, I haven't been very good about uh, publicizing it. Yeah, you mean. And I, I, I'm not sure why this has happened, but uh, I don't know. Like, we should really uh, put work into into updating the docs to just have the current stuff and get rid of the the old stuff or put it on uh, on the side somewhere where it doesn't confuse new packagers. Mm. No. Hello there. Uh, can I just add something on that? A good way to get engagement in the community on that, if you can spot problems that need to be updated, can you create a ticket and add it as a good first bug or something? Because it might encourage people to, that don't know anything about this to jump in and try to fix it. You know? Well, I, I, I mean, 
you don't need to do that. You open any page and you start reading it and then you see like, okay, this is formatted incorrectly. Um, this is, f I mean, like if you if you do packaging, you, you on, essentially on any page you will have stuff that is, uh, I mean, like I could open, I don't know, a hundred tickets uh, if I wanted to. Uh, I don't think it would make sense. I mean, I would just overwhelm the, the pipeline. Also, I do believe that uh, the RPM packaging uh, guide is actually approved by FESCO for the changes. So I'm not entirely sure that that would be a good first change uh, for, for someone. I mean, if it's like a documentation that is easy then to, to get your change merged, then okay. But if there's stuff that FESCO then have to wait in FPC, okay, but still. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. It was a good, uh, good discussion. Enjoyed the uh, session. Thanks for coming.